You're listening to The World at Eat with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Monday 1st of December 2014. School playground evacuated because of aggressive squirrel. Ofsted, Luton Borough Council not dealing with child sex exploitation consistently well. Far-right Europe has a crush on Moscow. Pope Francis prays alongside Grand Mufti in Istanbul's Blue Mosque. Islamic State, ISIS, calls for poisoning Westerners and running them down in the streets. Western media contains no reference to international conference in Damascus designed to combat terrorism and religious extremism. Thought for the day, vive la difference. And finally, a Texan joke. Before the news today, I would like to thank some people for all their hard work during the last year, and indeed the last few years. For our ITing, Dale. For our recordings and inputs, Eric, Nick, Russell, John. For the jokes on finally, Kathy, Marcella and Roger. To all of you, we wish a very happy festive season, leading up to and including Christmas. Not a winter fest or winter holiday or Black Sales Day, in more ways than one, but Christmas, the birth of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. UK News School playground evacuated because of aggressive squirrel. Robert Spencer on Jihad Watch writes, This story has nothing whatsoever to do with jihad, but it is emblematic of the abject weakness of contemporary Britain. If the Brits cower before a squirrel, even an unusually aggressive one, how do you think they'll stand up against Islamic jihadists and supremacists, especially unusually aggressive ones? That's right, they won't. They'll cringe, appease and surrender, and that's exactly what what they're doing. Watch for the Squirrel Council of Britain to protest against how the school children provoked this poor squirrel until he had no choice but to act, and for the squirrel himself to be appointed headmaster of this school before too long. School playground evacuated during breakfast time after unusually aggressive grey squirrel threatened children by Hannah Parry, Daily Mail, November 28th, 2014. Children were forced to evacuate a playground after a rampant squirrel caused havoc during break time. A teacher at Chater Infant School in Watford, Herefordshire, had to herd the youngsters back into the safety of the building after an unusually aggressive grey squirrel disrupted their afternoon playtime. One member of staff was even scratched during the encounter, but fortunately no children were hurt in the incident. Head teacher Amrit Bal Richards said they were monitoring the situation and the caretaker is being extra vigilant, but the squirrel has not been sighted again. She said, we did have an incident where we had a squirrel. It is very uncommon for a squirrel to be a little aggressive. It was a little bad-tempered. We will be monitoring the situation and the caretaker is being extra vigilant. World date. Sometimes I ignore Robert, but this was too succinct to pass up, and of course he is 100% right about British weakness. What head teachers, even Asian ones, should be worried about is the Muslim sexual abuse of school children, jihadist teachings, or the lack of real English being taught or spoken in their schools. Not a poor little squirrel who was incidentally in the UK before the migrant children. Squirrels rule. Ofsted, Luton Borough Council not dealing with child sex exploitation consistently well. In a survey, the first of its kind, the school's watchdog inspected the town council's current response to child sex exploitation, along with that of seven other local authorities across the country, Brent, Bristol, Camden, Kent, Oldham, Rochdale and Rotherham. The thematic inspection comes after a number of high-profile scandals over failings, which have embroiled Rochdale and Rotherham councils in controversy. The findings were also published a week after a series of sexual exploitation raids in Luton, after which six women and a child were taken into care. During the investigation, it was found that none of the eight local authorities inspected were covering child sexual exploitation well across the full range of responsibilities. The report read, The performance of local authorities in delivering services to children suffering or at risk of suffering sexual exploitation in response to statutory guidance has been variable both between and within the authorities. Some had used equality assurance processes to identify deficits in practice, 
For others, inspection brought appropriate focus to acknowledge deficits, and these are now identified as areas for development. Inspectors found that Luton, as well as each of the other seven councils, had young people known to be at risk of sexual exploitation being supported as children in need. The report added, inspectors found the child in need plans were often monitored less robustly than children than child protection or looked after children plans. None of the eight councils inspected were found to be using information about child children missing or absenting themselves from school effectively, which would allow them to make links with the bigger picture about child sexual exploitation. Although the report does not individually name councils when identifying shortfalls and successes in dealing with exploitation, LBC has said that the report identified areas in need of improvement for its assessments, planning and performance data. The council has said that at the time of the inspection it was already in the process of taking the necessary steps to address these issues. A spokesperson added, we are actively working to achieve the recommendations as stated in the report. In conjunction with key partners, we are reviewing policy, best practice and resources across the borough to ensure that sexual abuse is dealt with effectively and children and young people receive the necessary support and protection required. We appreciate there is still much more work to be done and to successfully tackle sexual exploitation, we need everyone to work together. Word at eight. It's all too easy to lump these cases as being perpetrated against vulnerable children or children in need. Many are young teenagers looking for thrills or some sort of support in society, and many are just normal youngsters. Look to your Muslim communities first. European News Far-right Europe has a crush on Moscow. Gabriel Tetro Faber, writing for the Moscow Times, Putin's defiance of the global establishment through his criticism of American and European policymaking has earned him supporters among the leaders of political parties disillusioned with the EU. International headlines have been rife with speculation about Russia's ties to Europe's far right in recent days, since news broke that France's right-wing National Front Party had borrowed €9 million Euros from the Moscow-based First Czech Russian Bank. Disillusioned with the EU, European far-right parties have redoubled their efforts to swing Europe's political pendulum back towards Russia, which embodies their yearning for strong leadership and the preservation of traditional values. Russia, in turn, has its eye on using these political parties as a platform to influence European policymaking, pundits have said. National Front leader Marine Le Pen, who has publicly supported Russian President Vladimir Putin's stance on the annexation of Crimea and chided French authorities for stalling the delivery of an expensive Mistral-class helicopter carrier to Russia, denied that the loan constituted a friendly gesture by the Kremlin. These insinuations are outrageous and injurious, Le Pen said, in comments carried by the French newspaper Le Monde on Sunday. Does getting a loan dictate our international position? Russian authorities have consistently expressed their disdain for broadly defined fascism, promoting a collective identity based on the Soviet Union's defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. In an address to Russian lawmakers last March, Putin partly justified Russia's annexation of Crimea on the basis of the notion that authorities in Kiev were nationalists, neo-Nazis, Russophobes and anti-Semites, and that he would not leave Crimea's ethnic Russian population in the hands of such leaders. This seemingly improbable alliance has far, has far less to do with Russia's anti-fascist state narrative than it does with mutual strategic interests, according to political pundits. Russia's crusade against what Putin referred to as the destruction of traditional values, which includes in its stance against gay rights and its crackdown on illegal migration, is in part what draws France's National Front and other European far-right parties to it. World at eight. Putin is a clever and a hard man, but however I admire him, I would never trust him. Only because the ethos of being a nationalist, which he is, makes him and other nationalists in other countries primarily concerned with their own country and its status, which is right and proper. Don't look to anyone other than your own tribe to even think about you. Pope Francis prays alongside Grand Mufti in Istanbul's Blue Mosque. In a gesture designed to highlight his commitment to interfaith dialogue, Pope Francis conducted a silent prayer alongside a senior Islamic cleric in Istanbul's Blue Mosque on Saturday. Facing Mecca, Francis bowed his head in prayer for several minutes while standing next to Istanbul's Grand, Grand Mufti Rami Yaran. The Vatican described the gesture as a moment of silent adoration of God. 
France's predecessor, Pope Benedict, caused dismay amongst many conservative Catholics and some Muslims when he appeared to pray in the same mosque on his visit to Turkey eight years ago. The Vatican felt compelled to publish a statement saying that Benedict had merely been in meditation, though he later acknowledged that he certainly turned his thoughts to God. Francis then paid a visit to the Hagia Sophia, the most important cathedral of orthodoxy for almost a thousand years. The basilica was turned into an imperial mosque under the Ottomans when they conquered the city in 1453 and converted into a museum after the foundation of the Turkish Republic in 1923. World at eight. I'm going to the sick bucket right now. What the hell is he doing? Going to convert next and exhort all the RCs in the world to do the same? Their God is not our God. Simple as that. World news. Islamic State ISIS calls for poisoning Westerners and running them down in the streets. In a new video, ISIS threatens to murder Westerners through a wide range of new means, including poisoning of food and drink and hit-and-run attacks. This marks an increase in an ambitious threat, says ISIS calls on Muslims to wage jihad in the path of Allah using easily accessible weapons. The seven-minute video, entitled What Are You Waiting For?, opens with a group of francophone ISIS fighters denouncing the West and throwing their French passports into a campfire. French is a spoken language in this video, which also contains Arabic and English subtitles. One jihadist known as Abu Osama al-Faransi states, This is a message from your French brothers who have made hijra to the Muslims who are still living in the land of Kuf Kufra. In other words, it is an appeal by ISIS fighters who have emigrated to lands controlled by the Islamic State to Muslims living in the land of the infidelity. Though the fighters in the, in the video mostly speak to Muslims living in France, they also have a broader audience in mind. For instance, Abu Mariam al-Fransi addresses those Muslims in France and elsewhere. The jihadis featured in the video implore Muslims to make hijra and emigrate to lands controlled by the Islamic State. But if the Muslims do not emigrate, Abu Mariam, holding a machine gun and a machete, reminds them, indeed, you have been ordered to fight the kafir, unbeliever or non-Muslim, wherever you find him, and encourages Muslims in the West to attack civilians in their home countries. Abu Salman al-Farasi introduces new methods to entice potential terrorists living in the West to commit murder in France, telling them to terrorise them and do not allow them to sleep due to fear and horror. Abu Salman continues, There are weapons and cars available and targets ready to be hit. Kill them, infidels, and spit in their faces and run over them with your cars. He goes on, Even poison is available, so poison the water and food of at least one of the enemies of Allah. Abu Mariam hopes that infidels will even fear travelling to the market. World at eight. Now what was that about the Pope facing Mecca? Western media contains no reference to international conference in Damascus designed to combat terrorism and religious extremism. Delegates from 25 Western and regional countries have discussed ways and means of combating terrorism and religious extremism. Syrian officials believe the event will raise awareness about the root cause of terrorism. During the event, high-ranking Syrian officials reminded the delegates about an unprecedented support for terrorism in the country Syria with an aim to create sectarian tensions and destroy that country. Prime Minister Wael Halaki stressed Syrian government's determination to continue fighting terrorism. International laws on terrorism and sanctions on Syria were also debated. U.S. experts slammed Washington for interference in Syria's internal affairs. Since 2011, dozens of armed Takfiri groups such as the Al-Qaeda-linked ISIL, Al-Nusra Front, the so-called Islamic Front and the Free Syrian Army have mushroomed in Syria. According to international human rights organisation, these groups, with the support of some Western, Arab and regional countries, have all committed crimes against humanity. Here in this conference and through media outlets covering it, experts are calling on the international community to stop terrorism from flowing into Syria. They say blocking terrorists from entering Syria is the most effective way to fight terrorism in the war-torn country. World to date. Our own Nick Griffin is over there at this conference at present and no doubt will comment on it when he returns. Thought for the day, Viva la Défense. Now, this is an article from John Puxty, which I'm using today. It's called Impetus. In a world in which we live, there are three disputable agents of power, 
influence and ultimately disorder. Spirituality, greed and thought. Spirituality is in connection with an indefinable reality that surrounds us, defies us or entices us just as the light or darkness of day or night engulfs us in our daily activities. Greed is a natural survival instinct to eat our fill whenever possible. It's been transmuted into materialism in just the same way that we have it changed from hunter-gatherers into farmers in order to survive the dearth of wild game food we'd hunted to extinction. Thought brought us from reasoning groups of survivors through independent city-states ruled by kings and princes and into political associations where the righteous inheritors of power, the people of the land, are in eternal conflict with ideologies. Capitalism, fascism, Marxism and various other wealthy entities that are little different from religious belief without God. Any two and often all three of these fundamental impetus factors form one concept of living, survival or dominance we have to deal with on a daily basis. It is not tolerance or into it is not intolerance or tolerance. We do not choose our compatriots, but rather live within a group into which we were born and with whom we feel an infinity. Just as men and women who have multiple sex partners to fulfil nature's desire to unite the most advantageous genes to enhance a society, there are those that intellectually and socially transgress these rules. Intellectual development rarely has much to do with common sense. More often it flaunts common sense to adopt ridiculous stances, idiotic ideas and traitorous attitudes because it can, rather than exercise restraint that common sense demands. Most of the more religious ideologies have only existed since the development of universities that promote concepts for the sake of the concept, which is outside 15th and 16th century classical education. Modern universities are little more than dumbed-down 18th century universities used to indoctrinate a poorly educated greater rump in mediocre in mediocre political thought, such as Marxism and its associated misconceptions. Religious intolerance has been replaced by political intolerance. At one time you were attacked, victimised or murdered for your religious views. While this is still the case in the Muslim world, in the West greater emphasis is now placed upon intolerance of political ideology. The true power, however, should not lie either with an idle rich elite or, or an idiotic intellectual elite, but rather with the people of the land. Those people that live by common sense and sound empirical judgment, who at the same time have the common decency not to tread on or exploit the weak, as the rich ruthlessly do. It is the common man and woman who works the land or labours in the factory or tends the cares for their family that should rule the nation. It is these people that create the wealth. A nation has its people. A people have their traditions, their identity and their language. Politics that is ruled by the wealthy or the ideology or the ideologically unsound intellectual, will always suppress a nation, try to destroy a people, or work to promote social disharmony. Only by giving power to the common man by simple proportional representation at the ballot box, legally binding referenda on major policy issues, and equality for all before the law, can our nation prosper. Now you wonder why I've called this thought Viva la Défense. Whilst reading this, I can but agree with the reasoning behind it, and also the outcome, should whatever John expects to happen, but I have to acknowledge that my reasoning is different. It may not be so intellectual or sound, but then life is lived in an unintellectual and unsound world full of unsound people, who do not think beyond the next meal or drink. Reality often intrudes upon good thinking, and even sensible thinking, as we all know to our cost. Another little snippet is a letter written by our Edward Cook, which he hopes will get printed. Sent to Sentinel Letters 28th 11th 14. Dear Sir, Now the PC Brigade on Mohammed Pervez Council think that it's fair game to discriminate against Christians by calling Christmas Winterfest, so that Muslims are not offended. What should we call Ramadan so as not to offend the Christian community? Lunafast? Yours sincerely, Mr Edward Cook. I think you can see where I'm going here. In a perfect world and a perfect country, without the huge problems of immigration and the general misuse of funds during a Labour government and all that entails, how can a farming people rule the land in which they do not farm or have farming communities? I'm not downing John's vision as he's a far-sighted and clever man, but everyone is entitled to their views. And mine is that had his vision been implemented after the last war, then we would not have the problems we have now. That was the time that this country, and indeed Europe, faced an even worse situation than the Third Reich. 
they faced democracy in all its two-faced glory of pseudo-Marxism and US benevolence and incidentally pro-Islamic feeling and anti-Judaic ones which are still growing. In fact, to be a member of the so-called far right, you have to be pro-Palestinian and anti-Jewish and the Reich has been gone 70 years. But some things have not changed. I am pro-Assad and I'm pro-Al-Sisi, but I'm also pro-Netanyahu, because these men are in their own countries with their own people fighting to stay afloat, Muslim and Jew alike, as indeed we are trying to stay afloat in what was once our Christian country, but is no longer. You only have to see the pictures from the Black Friday sales to see what this country has now become, a watering hole for the various dross of the world. Those who through greed and ignorance fight to come to the UK for money, health, benefits and crime. I don't care if they're whiter than me or black as the night. I don't care if they're Muslim, Hindu or whatever passes for a creed. I don't care how they make it and I certainly don't care if they don't. I don't care what their children do or think and I don't care if they don't like it here or feel uncomfortable. I simply do not care. They are not my people, they are not my culture or religion, and they ain't my tribe, simple as that. I am tribal. You are tribal and we are tribal. Underneath everything lies la difference. My one adverse thought on John's excellent one is that everybody is tribal. It's in our genes. Couple this with a raft of successive governments who have ruined our land and our poor farmers to feed foreigners and build for foreigners, and there is no people for the power to be handed to other than a foreign power or foreigners in our land. That is a fact. Gone is the time for vast farming communities to become the elite. That faded with the 60s and power to the people. There is anarchy and there is nihilism, as its bedfellows, and you don't want that. Separating church from state, government from people, crowns from ancestry is fraught with disasters. This doesn't mean we cannot think and we cannot plan, but you need a country that is peopled with your own for the most part and not the rest of the world with their ideas on how you and yours should live. Which usually means as second or third class citizens, as with no jobs, no industry, no education and no future, what is left? What we have now is the end of socialism, the beginning of a Marxist and non-religious state, which is basically anti-tribal and pro-diversity. It allows for all and sundry to enter and stay in this country and receive all the benefits, both official and unofficial, that we, the many first tribes, are simply not privy to. We are being voted off the block, and when we stir, we have the ever-present media to remind us that we are what we have become, a nation of hosts to a succession of parasites, and we had better bloody well enjoy it. Well, I don't, and I don't care of the plight of the rest of the human population of the world. I just care about me and mine and my country, and I'm sick and tired of having to justify my feelings in my own country in my own time. Look around, and if you like what you see, just shut your eyes, and it might all go away. And finally, a Texan joke. In a crowded city at a busy bus stop, a woman who was waiting for a bus was wearing a tight leather skirt. As the bus stopped and it was her turn to get on, she became aware that her skirt was too tight to allow her leg to come up to the height of the first step of the bus. Slightly embarrassed and with a quick smile to the bus driver, she reached behind her to unzip her skirt a little, thinking this would give her enough slack to raise her leg. Again, she tried to make the step only to discover she still couldn't. So, a little more embarrassed, she once again reached behind her to unzip her skirt a little more. For the second time, she attempted the step, and once again, much to her chagrin, she could not raise her leg. With a little smile to the driver, she once again reached behind to unzip a little more, and again was unable to make the step. About this time, a large Texan who was standing behind her picked her up easily by the waist and placed her gently on the step of the bus. She went ballistic and turned to the would-be Samaritan and screeched, How dare you touch my body? I don't even know who you are. The Texan smiled and drawled, Well, ma'am, normally I would agree with you, but after you unzipped my fly three times, I kind of figured we was friends. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>